Welcome to the Pleasant Green Missionary Baptist Church Sunday School Lesson for Easter Sunday morning, April 21st. We are in Lesson 8 and Unit 2. Unit 2 is entitled Call to Ministry. Call to Ministry. And from our Faith Way, uh, our Faith Pathway Adult Quarterly, our lesson title is Go and Tell. Go and tell. A devotional reading is taken from 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 12 to 22. Our background scripture, which is also our printed passage, is Matthew chapter 28, verses 1 to 15. Our lesson aims from the faith pathway is, number one, tell how the women's sorrow was turned to joy upon meeting the risen Christ. Number two, recall the joy that was present when you first accepted the good news about Christ. And number three, commit to a greater involvement in telling others the good news about Christ. The quarterly commentary has three major divisions after the introduction. The first is titled, The Shake-Up. That's covered between chapter 28, verses 1 to 4. The second is The Makeup. That's covered between Matthew 28, verses 5 and 10. And then the third is The Cover-Up. And that's covered between chapter 28, verses 11 and 15. From the standard commentary, the lesson title is Call to Believe the Resurrection. We have been called to believe the resurrection. And the lesson, additional aims are, number one, retell Matthew's record of the discovery of the empty tomb. Number two, compare and contrast the reactions of those who became aware of Jesus' body was missing, that Jesus' body was missing. And then number three, prepare a testimony based on the truth of the resurrected Christ. Standard has three major divisions as well. The standard commentary has three major divisions. The first is Amazing Sight, verses 1 to 4. Number two, Assuring words, verses five to seven, and number actually there has four divisions. I'm, I'm sorry. The third is astonishing appearance. That's covered between verses eight and ten, and the fourth is arranged cover up, covered between verses eleven and fifteen. We are going to be discussing a portion of the greatest story ever told. Uh, we're going to be talking about the greatest news man has ever heard in our lesson today. Uh, I hope you read the lesson. I hope you read the devotional reading. Uh, we may go back to uh, some portions of the devotional reading, which basically uh, is where Paul declares the utter futility of our faith if the dead rise not First of all, if there is no resurrection, and, and, and if certainly if Christ did not rise, then our faith is in vain and we are still in our sins. So in the way of uh, background, we know that uh, Jesus has entered Jerusalem a week earlier uh, triumphantly. Uh, we can read about that in Matthew chapter 21. Uh, to um, adoring or seemingly adoring crowds. We, we, we can suspect that most of them were just curiosity uh, seekers and, of course, overwhelmed by his popularity. But to the shouts of Hosanna, oh, Hosanna, blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. And throughout the week of his passion, uh, 
we we see he teaches and he teaches uh, with increasing intensity. Uh, his teaching uh, culminates uh, in the upper room where he is trying to compress uh, much information into his uh, apostles, the disciples, the 12 that would become apostles. And we know, of course, one of those betrayed him. Uh, he has uh, gone to Gethsemane. Uh, he's pleaded with his father that if it's possible to take the cup uh, from him, but nevertheless, not his will, but his father, the Lord's will be done. And we know he has surrendered his life. He's laid his life down on the cross and he has uh, he has commended his spirit to the Lord after asking his father from the cross to forgive those who crucified him for they knew not what they did. And now Jesus had told his disciples on several occasions that he was going to be handed over to the Gentiles. He was going to be crucified. And on the third day, he was going to be raised again. Now, I know uh, it's difficult for us to look back some 2,000, almost 20 years, and uh, and not understand why the disciples did not get it. They did not understand that, even after his death and after, as we read in our lesson today, uh, the proclamation of the women that he had risen, that they had actually seen him. They still did not believe it until he appeared himself to them. And he chastised them for their uh, unbelief. But uh, if we had been in that day, uh, we might have struggled uh, with, th with that, thinking perhaps that we misunderstood something that Jesus said, because if we believed him, him indeed to have been the, the Messiah, then the two, him dying, and, and uh, uh, was incongruent with our belief in who the Messiah was and how he was going to be the deliverer of Israel and the restorer of the kingdom, uh, that is, the, the great Davidic Solomonic kingdom to Israel. So with that, uh, we're going to jump into our, our lesson text. And we know, again, this is uh, after, well, our, actually our our first verse will set the stage for us as far as the setting is concerned. And verse 1 of Matthew chapter 28 reads, And in the end of the Sabbath, as it began to dawn toward the first day of the week, came Mary Magdalene and the other Mary to see the sepulcher. Now, the... The way that Matthew phrases this might be a little confusing. He said, in the end of the Sabbath, as it began to dawn. Well, this was actually after the Sabbath. The Sabbath had ended at approximately at sunset the evening before, uh, which would have been a Saturday. Uh, but... The women uh, who were uh, had prepared to complete the job that uh, Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus had hastily done before the Sabbath began, which would have been at sunset on Friday. If you recall, they uh, Joseph begged for um, Jesus's body and was given the body by by Pilate. Uh, ordinarily, uh, criminals uh, that were crucified, bodies were thrown in a pit and just allowed to decay in the most degrading way uh, in an open pit. Uh, but Joseph wanted to give Jesus uh, a more dignified burial in his own tomb, which was hewn out of a rock. And of course, we know uh, because the Jews had uh, had heard his disciples say that he had said he was going to uh, to rise from the dead. Uh, they wanted to make sure that no one came and stole his body, so they requested a watch. And that was at least four guards, at least four guards. And they actually sealed with the, uh, uh, of course, the gubernatorial seal, the stone that was placed in front of the mouth of the tomb. 
So Joseph and, uh, if you recall, Joseph and Nicodemus brought the equivalent of a hundred pounds of spices and and they packed them in with wrappings um, and they hastily buried Jesus and they realized that they were doing a hasty job but they needed to complete this uh, get him in the tomb before sunset and get home before sunset uh, if they had to walk more than a Sabbath day's journey to get home uh, the women, of course, were there. Uh, they saw where Jesus was entombed. Uh, curiously, uh, not curiously, we know his uh, male disciples had all fled. Uh, and uh, so they knew where to go to finish the job that the men had begun. But they needed to wait until light, until daylight. And that's why he said, toward as it began to dawn toward the first day of the week. They wanted to get there first thing, first dawn. And we know from other Gospels, as they approached the tomb, they asked themselves, who would roll away this great stone? And we can only assume that uh, Joseph and Nicodemus, perhaps with the aid of the guards, rolled this tomb and the stone into place. And it, uh, it, it was certainly not going to be uh, roll back or displaced by the women. Now Mary Magdalene is mentioned by name uh, in this verse. Her last name was not Magdalene. Uh, it simply uh, denoted the town that she came for, from and it was located on the shore of the Sea of Galilee. It was Magdala. So uh, a better way of saying this is Mary of Magdala. And we know Jesus cast seven devils out of her. If we go over to Mark uh, chapter 16, verse 1, we discover who the other Mary was. And that was Mary, the mother of James. Uh, and let me just turn over there. And Salome, Mary, the mother of James and Salome. Uh, and we uh, we know that there were a number of, of Marys uh, that were disciples of Jesus, and it, it's easy to get them mixed up. But at least those two uh, came to the tomb to finish the uh, preparation uh, for Jesus' proper burial. Verse 2, And behold, there was a great earthquake, for the angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone from the door and sat on it. Now, you know, this. we know that there was a great earthquake at the moment of Jesus' death. We see that in Matthew chapter 27, 50 and 51. Uh, and we know that throughout uh, ancient Israel, uh, God revealed his authority awesome power to them in earthquakes and lightnings and fires uh, and this is not um, a, uh, a natural earthquake that just as the earthquake that occurred at Jesus's death was not natural this is an earthquake to get attention uh, and it is a supernatural tremor not a natural one now the angel of course, being a very powerful being, supernatural being, had no difficulty rolling the stone back. And we know uh, that he did not roll the stone back to allow Jesus to exit. Of course, that was unnecessary. Uh, Jesus had already left the tomb, but the stone was rolled back in order to give evidence that the tomb was empty. And we'll read more about that in just a moment. But Matthew goes on to describe the angel. He says his countenance, his appearance was like lightning and his raiment white as snow. He was brilliant in his appearance, in other words. And he looked like uh, the glorified uh, Christ did on at the Mount of Trans Transfiguration. Uh, he uh, reflected the Shekinah glory, perhaps, but he is a, a brilliant supernatural being. Uh, verse 4 says, For the fear of him the keepers did shake 
and became as dead men, the keepers, of course, being the Roman guard. And this awesome appearance of this angel suddenly and accompanied by an earthquake. Now, they're shaking. Imagine, put yourself in their place. You're shaking because of this violent earthquake. And this is a great earthquake. You know, this may have been a seven or eight on the Richter scale. We don't know. Uh, but it was a violent earthquake, great earthquake, accompanied by the supernatural, the appearance of the supernatural being. And they were petrified. It said uh, they did shake, of course, aided by the earthquake. But I'm sure there was some trembling going on beside what the earthquake was causing. And they were just uh, awestruck and petrified and became as dead men. Of course, they didn't actually die, but they were comatose, if you will, at least for a period. Verse 5, And the angel answered and said unto the women, Fear not ye, for I know that ye seek Jesus, which was crucified. Now, one of the first things we might notice is that the angel did not seek to calm the, the guards. Uh, we don't know whether they were believers or non-believers, but I, I think we can almost assume that they were not believers, but we don't know. But they were petrified, and the angel did nothing to allay their fears. He allowed them to be comatose, and of course we know what followed. We'll, we'll review what followed in a few verses. Uh, but he does uh, try to comfort the women. We imagine that they were uh, terrified as well at his appearance and, of course, the earthquake. And as was the custom of angels when they appeared in human form uh, to men, uh, to people, uh, they attempted first to, to calm the person uh, or people, but so that they can deliver the message that God gave them to deliver. You know, first and foremost, the angels are messengers. Uh, they do other things, of course, they, uh, uh, but uh, they are uh, generally found delivering messages for God. And he tells them to fear not, and he assures them, he comforts them by letting them know he knows what they're there for. You know, and I, and I think if someone... Uh, uh, terrifying as they may appear, uh, calms you or seems to know what your purpose is, then uh, that would have a calming effect. I think it would on me. So he says, I know that ye seek Jesus who was crucified. So he is confirming and affirming that he was crucified and he knows that and he knows that what their purpose is. Uh, verse 6a reads, He is not here, for he is risen as he said. Now this uh, is probably taking them aback. You know, he's uh, calmed them. Uh, he's he's uh, confirmed that he knows what their purpose is. But then he, he says he is not here. Uh, and we know in another gospel, uh, the women fear that someone has taken him. Uh, and has uh, uh, moved him someplace else. But this angel, of course, tells him that he is risen as he said. Well, when did he say that? Well, uh, he said that in Matthew 16, 21, Matthew 17, 22, and 23, Matthew 20, verses 17 to 19. And when you have a few minutes... Uh, Go back and, and review the times that he told his disciples that he, uh, uh, in fact, let's let's just take a minute and look at uh, one or two of those. Uh, because, you know, Jesus made it very clear what was going to happen. And um, and as I, as I said earlier, it's difficult to understand why his uh, disciples didn't get it. So. Uh, let's look at Matthew 16, 21. He says, and this is, of course, after Jesus asked uh, his disciples, whom do men say that I am? And, and of course, uh, they're, uh, they're coming, they've come into the coast of uh, Caesarea Philippi. And, of course, Peter gives that 
that profession that, of course, God gave him, that confession that he was the Christ, the Son of the living God. And, of course, uh, Jesus tells him that flesh and blood had not revealed that unto him and tells him he's the rock and so forth. But skipping down to 21, he says, From that time forth began Jesus to show unto his disciples how that he must go in, unto Jerusalem and suffer many things of the elders and the priests and the scribes and be killed and raised again the third day. Well, subsequent to him beginning there, he told them at least uh, three more times, uh, at least two more times, I should say, and uh, no, three more times. Uh, and, uh, of course, as I said, they didn't get it. Uh, so let's go on. Verse uh, 16b says, Come, see the place where the Lord lay. So the angel, of course, has rolled back the stone, not for purposes to release Christ or to allow him to come out, but to demonstrate or to show that the tomb is empty. <laughs> we know that... Uh, the Lord Jesus did not rise in the same body with the same uh, type of body, if you will, uh, that he was crucified in. He rose in a uh, supernatural body that was able to move through locked doors uh, as, as we see if we read beyond our lesson text today. And, of course, moving through uh, the the, the the grave clothes he was wound in that were laid neatly on the slab that his body was laid on, and, of course, through the stone that was sealing the tomb. So we have to, we have to assume that the, the, the women do go and, and inspect the tomb and see that it is indeed empty. And then the angel goes on to say, beginning in verse 7a, uh, and go, he's telling them to come and see, see the empty tomb. And then he says, and go quickly and tell his disciples that he is risen from the dead. Now, again, he's told them that many times. The angel has told them to come and see. Uh, and now he's telling them to go and tell. And I think both uh, commentators, the uh, adult quarterly commentator and the standard commentator uh, make a point of being that those being instructions for us as well us Christians today to come and see uh, see the empty tomb and, and we can take that to mean to understand that that Jesus did indeed raise uh, arise bodily from the dead uh, the tomb was empty uh, his dead body is no place to be found, no bones, no uh, no remnants of his body on earth to be found. And we are to go and tell about that resurrection and also what it means. I mean, it means if that is if Christ rose, uh, had the power to lay his life down and to pick it up again. We, he has the power to raise us from the dead as well. And I'm going to go um, back to our devotional reading just to, to pull a verse or two out. Now, uh, you know, Paul starts talking about uh, raising rhetorical questions in verse 12 of verse chapter, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Now, if Christ uh, be preached that he rose from the dead, how say some among you that there is no resurrection from the dead? And he goes on to, to talk about resurrection from the dead in general. And then he turns to the resurrection of Christ. We skip down to verse 17. He says, and if Christ be not raised, your faith is in vain. Ye are yet in your sins. The, the resurrection of Jesus Christ is central to what we believe as Christians, we cannot escape that. There is no Christianity without the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Verse 18, then they say, which are fallen asleep, I'm sorry, then they also, which are fallen asleep in Christ, are perished. Verse 19, if in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men most miserable. 
But now is Christ risen from the dead and become the first fruits of them that slept. That's verse 20. The first fruits. The first fruits were a sample, a sampling of what was to follow. We read throughout the Old Testament how the uh, the Israelites were to uh, observe or were to offer the first fruits to the Lord. And it was certainly uh, to be symbolic of what was to follow and, of course, them putting the Lord first and foremost in their lives. So we, uh, Christ, his, his uh, uh, being raised from the dead was emblematic or the first fruit, uh, first of all of us who will be raised from the dead. Uh, let's go on. Part B of uh, uh, verse 7 says, And behold, he goeth before you into Galilee. There shall ye see him. Lo, I have told you. Now, again, Jesus has told them not only that he's going up to Jerusalem, he's going to be uh, handed over to the Gentiles, he's going to be betrayed by the, the scribes and the Pharisees and the elders, and they're going to treat him brutally. Uh, but he, he, he tells them uh, in Matthew chapter 26, if we back up a couple of verses, I mean a couple of chapters, 32, also in Mark uh, 14, 28, that he is going before his disciples to Galilee. That's where he intends to meet them after his resurrection. Now, of course, the... The disciples at this moment are cowering in the upper room uh, at some place or someplace in Jerusalem uh, and uh, maybe fearing that those who crucified uh, Jesus would do the same uh, for them uh, uh, were they discovered. Uh, eventually, of course, they intend to return to Galilee uh, because that's their home, but uh, Jesus is telling them, uh, through this angel, or the God is telling them through this angel to go now, and he and the Lord Jesus would meet them there. So he's given the women uh, instructions, again, beginning at 6B, uh, come and see the place where the Lord lay, go quickly and tell his disciples that he is risen first, and then, of course, tell them to go to Galilee where the Lord Jesus will meet them. Verse 8, And they departed quickly from the sepulcher with fear and great joy and did run to bring the disciples news. So they departed uh, in obedience to the angel and quickly with dispatch. And they have mixed emotions here. They have fear. that They're probably still trembling from the earthquake and the angel's appearance. And the joy and, and joy, the fact that uh, Jesus is risen, and no doubt they believed him. They saw the empty tomb. They believed the words of this supernatural being. And so there's a mixture of fear and great joy that they're feeling as they run. They want to get this great news to the disciples uh, as soon as possible. And, of course, we know it's not included in our lesson text today. But we know that when they get to the disciples, the disciples uh, listen to them in disbelief and they they consider what they're saying to be something like a, a, a tale that's being told, some type of a fairy tale, if you will. And we know that uh, the testimony of women was not allowed in court back in first century uh, Judea. Uh, but uh, And the Lord shows us what he thinks of that, that custom, in giving them this great news to pass on, uh, to be witnesses of. Um, but we, uh, we do know that they were curious enough. Uh, Peter and, Jen, and John came to the tomb and discovered that it was empty. And, 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 and again, this is beyond our lesson text. And I don't know, I mean, certainly the Lord knew how they were going to react, but the Lord, had they been obedient to what the women told them to do, then their first sighting of the resurrected Lord might have been in Galilee, 
instead of the Lord having to appear to them where they were supernaturally and call them the knuckleheads that they were for not believing. In other words, to chastise them for not believing what the angel had told the women. Now, uh, we know the women are in store for yet another surprise as they go hastily to his disciples with this news. Verse 9, And as they went to tell his disciples, behold, Jesus met them, saying, All hail! And they came and held him by the feet and worshipped him. Now, Jesus... uh, uh, appears to them, we don't know at what point, uh, maybe soon after they leave the angels, and uh, they recognize him. Uh, we, we know in other instances Jesus uh, disguises himself, if you will, uh, uh, when he uh, walks uh, with the two disciples on the road to Emmaus, for example, but in this case he allows himself to be recognize and they recognize him and are overjoyed i'm sure i'm i'm i'm, I'm certain uh, at his salutation and they fall down and worship him and uh, uh and holding his feet they 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 they're, 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 they're on their knees and they're just worshiping him and i'm and no doubt praising god for his resurrection verse 10 then said jesus unto them Be not afraid, go tell my brethren that they go into Galilee, and there shall they see me. Now Jesus, of course, um, uh, realizes that they are astonished at his appearance. Uh, No doubt they're wondering if they were, if this was really happening. I'm sure it was a surreal experience for them, and he tells them, not to be afraid, not to be afraid of his appearance because they saw him dead and they realized he was dead when he was entombed. Uh, and he tells them again, just what the angel told them, to go tell his brethren, meaning the, the 11 uh, now, uh, to go into Galilee and there they shall see him. So Jesus is requiring some faith on their part he's requiring that they believe these women they believe that uh he has risen from the dead as he said he would on numerous occasions to them before he was crucified uh yet uh before and and no doubt jesus knew that they weren't going to be immediately obedient to to that commandment and so he appears to them as well uh, before they go to Galilee. We know ultimately they are, uh, they do meet in Galilee, but that's several days later. Now, um, now we're going to transition into, uh, a whole different scene. If you, if you will, this is, uh, changing the set, uh, from one scene. We're going from one scene to another. And we're going to talk about this uh, arranged cover-up, beginning at verse 11. Now, when they were going, behold, some of the watch came into the city. That's when the women were going uh, to give the angels' message and Jesus' Jesus's message to the disciples or the apostles. It says, some of the watch came into the city. They, they finally came to they had been comatose because of the awesome appearance of the angel in the earthquake. And showing unto the chief priest all the things that were done. Now, you might ask yourself, well, hmm, why didn't they go to Pontius Pilate? <laughs> or why didn't they go to their general or their captain? Well, <laughs> you can probably answer that question pretty pretty quickly. Uh, Roman soldiers... Uh, if they fell asleep on duty, if they fail to execute whatever the commandment was that they were charged with, uh, command was they were charged with, they could be executed. They could forfeit their lives. And so they went to the to the chief priest, and for and for two reasons, you know, they 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 really um, because the chief priest had requested the watch, they had some ground some basis for doing that they thought someone would come and steal 
the body. However, the body got up and and left. <laughs> but uh, so they went to them because they had requested to watch. But more importantly, as we'll see uh, in verse 14, because they feared their superior, they feared Pontius Pilate, and no doubt they they thought the chief priests uh, would have some influence uh, that would help them save their lives. Uh, so let's look at verses uh, 12 and 13 together. Uh, and when they were assembled with the elders, this being the, the chief priests, uh, uh, when they were assembled with the elders and had taken counsel, they gave large money unto the soldiers, saying, Say ye, his disciples came by night and stole him away while we slept. Now, you know, we could spend, we could spend a fair amount of time talking about these two verses and how um, we, we can imagine the soldiers gave them a detailed account of what they observed until they conked out. Uh, they, the earth quaked, and, and no doubt the, they were aware of the earthquake, uh, and uh, it was a great earthquake at that, and them seeing this supernatural being, this brilliant being, uh, and uh, him rolling away the stone. Now, the the chief priests and scribes, uh, y- you have to wonder, uh, could they have really disbelieved these guards? Could they have believed that all four of them were lying, were all four of them had had some type of great hallucination? Uh, did they really believe that his disciples had come and, and stole the body? Uh, I it's difficult for me to think that they did not believe these guards. And if they believed these guards, they had to recognize that what was done was of God. I mean, they had to realize that. But in spite of that, they took counsel. Now, I would imagine that part of this counsel that was they were talking among themselves was dealing with, hey, whether this was of God or not. Uh, but they concluded, whether it's of God or not, we're going to cover it up. We're going to cover up this great resurrection of God uh, so that the people uh, don't believe that it happened, won't know that it happened, and our uh, we will preserve our place. Okay, if, if we go back to uh, John 11, uh, 48, that we mentioned last week, the, the real motive behind the uh, uh, the Jews uh, wanting to crucify Jesus, wanting to kill Jesus, is they didn't want uh, Jesus, uh, the people, to follow Jesus, and they didn't want to lose their place. They didn't want the Romans to come and take their place. But look at John chapter 11, verse 48. Well, we know ultimately they lost their place uh, anyway, and the Romans took their uh, their country in uh, uh, destroyed uh, uh, their country in 70 A.D. Uh, but but anyway, so so they've they've given this story. The guards have given this story. They've admitted uh, what they've 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 probably given great detail of what they saw before they conked out. And then uh, his uh, after this council, after these uh, uh, the elders and the chief priests. Uh, talk among themselves as to what they're going to do. They decide they're going to cover this up and they're going to pay as they did for the betrayal of Jesus. They're going to use money uh, to buy these soldiers off. So they give them large money and they say uh, uh, say that his disciples came by night and stole them. And of course, the soldiers recognize that that's sealing a death warrant. They're death warrant if they if they say that. Uh, but they they are trusting that the uh, as we'll see in the next verse, that the chief priests uh, and the elders can persuade Pilate. So verse 14 says, And if this come to the governor's ear, we will persuade him and secure you. Well, the soldiers no doubt uh, realize that uh, this same group persuaded Pilate to crucify an innocent man or have an innocent man crucified. And they did that, of course, with the threat, with the threat of, of calling uh, Pilate, uh, accusing him of not being loyal to Caesar by recognizing another king or someone that would oppose 
uh, Caesar's rule. Uh, so the soldiers, as we see in verse 15a, so they took the money and did as they were taught. They are trusting the disciples rather than, uh, I'm sorry, trusting the chief priests and the elders rather than than what they had to acknowledge as, as, as God, an act of God, or God himself. Uh, and, of course, uh, it, 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 it probably wouldn't matter if they confess that they believe that God had done this. Uh, their life might have been taken anyway for dereliction of duty. Part B of 15 says, And this saying is commonly reported among the Jews until this day. Now, it's believed that Matthew, the Gospel of Matthew, there seems to be some uh, disagreement as to whether it was the first or the second. Uh, some believe that Mark was the first Gospel. Um, one of the commentators here states that, he, that Matthew was. Uh, but no matter, this is believed to have been written around 50 A.D., so it was about 20 years after uh, Jesus rose from the dead so this uh, this uh, lie that uh, the disciples stole his body uh, has been circulating for some 20 years at this point but no one was ever able to produce the corpse and no doubt there were searches made for it uh, one other thing that uh, I think should be mentioned here, and you may have heard this before. Uh, many of the disciples, uh, the apostles, were martyred. Uh, we know tradition has it that Peter was even crucified upside down. Uh, and there are two uh, things that people will die for, at least two things that people will die for. They will die for the truth. Uh, they will die, uh, or they will die believing that something is the truth. Uh, the, uh, the, the Islamic martyrs, if you will, if you want to call them that, um, will strap on bombs and go blow themselves up and kill what they call infidels, believing that they are, in doing that in a holy jihad, they're instantly going to be translated to heaven with 72 versions. Uh, they believe that, and they believe it to the point that they're willing to sacrifice their life for it. Uh, of course, the Christians throughout uh, the last 2,000 years, Polycarp uh, uh, not wanting to give a pinch of incense, uh, or throw a pinch of incense in the fire and say uh, that, G that Caesar was Lord, uh, uh, was burned at the stake, was bur and, 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 and burned singing uh, of God's praises. Uh, but so 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 many have died for the truth and for Christ's sake. But there's no one can cite a person that died for something for a lie that they knew to be a lie. OK, so you die for the truth or you die for some for a lie that you believe to be the truth. But no one that anyone's aware of has died for a lie that they know to be a lie. And so that says something about uh, uh, the, 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 the reality of, uh, or the, the, of, of the Lord's resurrection. And we know if we read further in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, uh, Paul goes on to give uh, testimony about the eyewitnesses of Jesus' resurrection. The fact that there had been over 500 that had seen him at one time, the resurrected Christ at one time, and many of them were alive and could be questioned at that day. Okay, uh, and and there's more evidence for the resurrection of Jesus Christ than there is for almost anything else that happened throughout ancient throughout antiquity. So as we celebrate the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ this Easter Sunday morning, let's realize that 
without that resurrection, uh, we have no hope beyond the grave that he was and is the first fruits of all who will follow. Jesus demonstrated his power while he was here on earth to raise the dead. But those that he raised, he resurrected to life, died again. But Jesus has the power to raise us and give us in the last day glorified bodies suited for eternity that will never age. And we look forward to being res ultimately resurrected. Our spirits, as we know, will go to be with the Lord when we die, when they depart this body. But these bodies will ultimately be resurrected as his was. And they will be glorified and suited for eternity. And so we praise the Lord because he is risen and he has risen indeed. May God bless you and may he ever keep you.